at the joint seminar for the Centre for Migration and Diaspora Studies and the Department of Anthropology. And I'm delighted to be able to introduce Safet Hadji Mohamedovic today, who's going to um, be talking to us about uh, um, uh, anthropology has had a long relationship with concepts of time, but obviously more recently, the whole question of affects and temporality has been extremely important, uh, an important addition to um, the things that we research, and especially when we come to look at migra migration and displaced communities. Um, so I'm delighted that we're having this paper today. Um, Safet is a uh, research associate, uh, associate at the, uh, in interfaith relations at the University of Cambridge. He also works on our summer school here on the travel, tourism and pilgrimage uh, uh, program that we do. Uh, he has a book, Waiting for Elijah, which I think uh, some of the, what he's going to present us with today is going to be based on. And he's going to be talking about the spatio-temporal continuity and fractures in the lives of returnees to southeastern Bosnia. Um, especially around the disrupted sacred calendar of syncretic feasts um, and around the figure of Saint Elijah as well, which is a shared Christian Muslim uh, figure. Um, so I think Safet's going to be talking to us today for about around 40 minutes, 40, 45 minutes. Is that enough time for you? And that will be followed by questions. So the title of the paper is Waiting to Wait, Exile Time, Sacred Landscapes and Struggles to Return in the Bosnian the Narek Highlands. So Safet, I'll hand over to you and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very, very much Parvati. Um, good, whatever time it is to you. Um, I am very grateful to Ruba, Salih, to Parvati, to Kimberly for organizing this wonderful series, first of all, uh, and then for inviting me. Uh, to contribute. Uh, and uh, my plan is indeed, uh, as Parvati mentioned, to return to some of my uh, previous writing, including that book, Waiting for Elijah. Um, now, I'm very happy also to see some of my favorite researchers and some of my favorite anthropologists in the chat room. Uh, so it's quite a, an exciting, if daunting, task ahead. Um, and I look forward to the conversation afterwards. Now, let me see if um, I can share my screen. First of all, now, do you all see that? Just uh, nod your heads. I see a couple of heads. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, the plan is really for the session to uh, return to the, some of my ethnographic research in Bosnia and through it attempt to um, situate the notions of waiting and spatio-temporal exile uh, and or distemporalities uh, in Bosnia. Now, um, as Parvati mentioned, anthropological studies of temporality, of home, migration and belonging are a rapidly developing field. Um, and particularly over the past decade or so, I would say. Uh, and as a subgenre, uh, we find a number of longitudinal studies of waiting. Um, and this is just a snapshot uh, of some book titles uh, that came out, um, uh, although the actual number of books, articles, chapters, dissertations, projects is now much wider. And we had a chance uh, recently to, 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 to also hear about uh, one of these big projects and waiting uh, uh, when Christine Jakobsen spoke um, for this series. Uh, so um, many of, of, of these uh, projects and of these books appeared relatively recently, even some of the slightly older ones like Ghassan Haj's uh, edited collection on waiting, a beautiful edited collection on waiting, did not originally feature in my methodological framework. Um, some eight years ago, I decided to study religious proximities in the aftermath of systematic ethno-religious cleansing in Bosnia, which occurred in the early 1990s and in different forms continues still in this landscape as a project, post-war sort of project, to, 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 to finish up some of these uh, forms of ethnic cleansing that began with war. My guiding literature uh, at the time was primarily in anthropology of landscape, 
Uh, but I was not really sure where to conduct this research. And even though it did end up branching into multi-sided field work, I, I wanted to have a, a deeper understanding and perhaps a more significant body of research stemming from attention to quote unquote one place. Little did I know that this one place would split into several temporally oriented ones. Uh, I remember two peculiar engagements that shifted my direction to Southeast Bosnian highlands. One was an early interview with Jevad, an internally displaced person from the field of Gatsko, who spoke to me for several hours in the cafe of Hotel Bristol in Mostar. He gave me, in what seemed like one breath, a detailed, vibrant, visceral depiction of a karst field rich in interreligious coexistence relations between Muslims, Serbs, and Gurbeti Roma, a landscape punctuated by the sequences of seasonal colors, chores, herbs, get togethers, and shared feasts. And when I asked specifically about the effects of the 1990s war, Javad searched for some evidence that refugees can indeed once again have a good life there and return. At the same time, my other early engagement was with a website intriguingly titled Gatsko in my mind. It was a diasporic portal into a world of photographs, memories, and discussions and stories about Gatsko, where exiled people inhabited their landscape with great attention to detail. This website, Gatsko in my mind, was a grassroots movement wasn't supported by any kind of funds, any institutions, and so on, quite uh, to the contrary. Uh, its antipode was the official internet presentation of the Gatsko municipality, which set forth the political structure of the municipality and gave a short history of the town. In this short history, all references to non-Serbs and traditions Serbs shared with others had been very carefully omitted. Uh, so, influenced by Gatsko in my mind, I traveled to Gatsko, to real Gatsko, as it were, quote unquote, for the first time. I did not see much else. My travel itinerary was already indicative of the kind of geography in the making to which Gatsko was subscribed in the 1990s. After its departure from East Sarajevo, or Serb Sarajevo, as it was officially known for a decade, the minibus stopped to let off and receive passengers at homogenized villages and towns along its route. In other words, we had been carefully driven through the jurisdiction of Republika Srpska, the Serb Republic, one of the two entities forged in the war of the 1990s and confirmed through the Dayton Peace Agreement in 1995. It was winter, and we drove in to the field through the filmic mountain peaks of Cemirno. I was breathless at the sight. And as the bus rolled down, a capacious karst landscape opened suddenly before us. It seemed endless. The snow covered land had lost the strong outlines of the horizon, melting it into the sky. I experienced this descent many times afterwards, but the first one, still lingered through the memories of its excitement. The landscape, just like the one in diasporic narratives and the website, seemed stated, uninterrupted, almost paradigmatic, and I lost focus on the detail. It took me a substantial while to notice the image of Draža Mihailović, the infamous Second World War general of the Serb royalist guerrillas on the wall of the bus stop the ruined houses on every corner, um, the nationalist sculptures, the gigantic thermal power plant with its white slag heap the size of a small mountain, the graffiti celebrating people convicted for genocide spray painted around the town. And it still seems possible to me to arrive at one bus stop, but two different places. In the center of the field of Gatsko is the town of Gatsko, a completely ethno-religiously cleansed space. 
near a site where a mosque was raised to the ground in 1992 on the main intersection, a new church of the Holy Trinity had been erected. In appearance and size, it resembled none of the other older churches in Gatsko. Like many other post-war churches in the region and across the diasporic world, in fact, it was a replanted image of Serb nationhood in its neo-Byzantine style and echoing the style of the medieval monastery of Gracenica in Kosovo. Now uh, an independent or semi-independent country, Kosovo continues to function as a place of great symbolic importance for Serb nationalism and primarily centered through the myths about the battle that took place on the field of Kosovo in 1389 between the Ottoman army and the Christian medieval crowns of the region. The introduction of this symbolic language into Gatsko thus projected a unified identity. A distinct nation was being forged through designated authentic materials from the past. In 2013, as part of a municipal project to beautify Gatsko, a, a wall next to the church was adorned with graffiti saying, Kosovo and Metohia, the soul of the Serb man. The traditions of local Orthodox Christianity were thus systematically subjected to pan-ethno-national unification. The nationalist temporal project constructed histories and futures of ethnic suffering, always on the horizon and given as an ominous warning in the speeches of the clergy. On his visit to Gatsko in May of 2012, Patriarch Irine of the Serbian Orthodox Church stood in front of this new church in Gatsko to announce, to the joy of all Serbdom, my soul is peaceful when I say, this is the Piedmont of Ser Serbdom. By making this reference to the role of the Piedmont region in the Italian national unification, he assigned Gatsko a vital role in the maintenance of the ethnoscape. Territory and religion were conflated into a single identitary trope. The human body was equated with the national body. The field was occupied with ordained dead bodies, which naturalized power and symbolized its loss and the need for it to be regained. Uh, so as you can see here, mass graves were read through ethnic selection as with Korich Kayama, uh, a sort of a natural karst pit into which uh, bodies of a Muslim family called uh, Dizdari, uh, were thrown in the First World War, and then Orthodox Christians from the village of Korita were thrown into it in the Second World War. Now, the contemporary commemoration of this site uh, sort of uh, looks at a layer of, of these bodies in, in this uh, mass grave. And uh, when the commemoration is organized, uh, sort of local historians, regional historians give modules in history, um, uh, very much again filled with warnings about the future. So the nationalist temporal politics latched onto a particular reading of the past and future, whilst uh, which constructed the present as a perpetually precarious endeavor to distance one's self from the other. Um, those unfitting to this image were exiled, both spatially and temporally. Scattered around the field are satellite villages, which have their own satellite hamlets. To the south is the village of Kula, the only part of the landscape to which a few mostly solitary and elderly Muslims had returned. The lands of the nomadic Gurbeti Roma were empty. They did not return after the war. And the returnees lived under lockdown in their villages and considered the town to be a hostile crossing. They remembered how upon the first return, late 90s, uh, their buses had been stoned and landmines were placed into the rubbles of their houses. The mosque in the village of Kula had been burned once more since its first post-war reconstruction. The school in the village of Kula optimistically rebuilt after the war through a Spanish grant entitled Support to Sustainable Return, stood empty. Canita, the only returnee child, 
lived next to the school, which was a hollow reminder of hope and its discontents. To endure such a disorienting violence, the returnees constructed two opposing temporally specific landscapes, the homely past and unhomely present. From the past, only the defining moments of social touch were selectively nurtured. My interlocutors seldom spoke about this present. Their narratives turned to a landscape as structured by the cyclical calendar shared, shared by Muslims, Christians, and Gurbeti. To understand their orientations, we need to briefly consider this traditional time as narrated by my interlocutors. So this image was taken in late March, if you can believe it. For the better part of the year, the field of Gatsko was locked under heavy snow, so heavy that all social interaction would be reduced to a few houses in the neighborhood, uh, which would organize storytelling evenings called siela, literally sit-ins, and landscape was the main topic of these sielas. Uh, not so much the one sealed in frost, but the one that's on the temporal horizon. They waited in their lockdown for the first sign of change, Blagoviest, literally glad tidings, the feast of Annunciation on the 7th of April, according to the Julian calendar, marked by Muslims and Christians alike. To mark the change, children from all the villages would seek out the highest hilltops and light tall bonfires around the field in the evening. The cattle were taken out of the stables for the first time, and the children herding them to pasture would sing this rhyme. The Annunciation, glad tidings, the cattle into gluttony, and the shepherds into coma. The full swing of spring was celebrated, celebrated through intricate rituals on the 6th of May, Djurjevdan or Yurieva, which is George's day. At the wake of dawn, before the daylight is set, young women would go either to river rapids or water mills and wash their faces with Omaha, the magical water that brings health and prosperity. Young men wake up early to watch the ritual from safe distance, while the girls attempt to hide. The girls decorated their house doors with miloduch, the hyssop blossom, which translates literally as kind spirit. As the evening would fall, young men would sneak up to houses of the girls to steal or scatter the hyssop blo uh, blossoms of the girls they liked. The girls who knew or at least hoped this will happen, according to the narratives, then pretended to be angry and complain about the loss of these virginal flowers. Young women were pushed high into the air on swings attached to large trees, especially oaks. They planted nettle in front of their houses or in the manure close to the farm sheds to unriddle the directions of their marriage proposals from the turning of the nettle leaves. Women lashed themselves with the witties of willow or cornel branches, hoping to get pregnant. Around the same time, the nomadic Gurbeti Roma communities would arrive to the field. Now, this image that you see is actually from a central Bosnian Roma celebration of George's day because uh, Roma did not return to Gatsko. Uh, Roma, Gurbeti Roma in Gatsko worked at tinning copperware and copper dishes for communities, for the settled communities, generally rece receiving in return fresh farm produce or cooked food. The settled Christians and Muslims uh, celebrated George's day with the Gurbeti Roma, and the feast included a dance around a large bonfire. Anna, one of the returnees, described this longing. We knew everything about them, their every step. After a long winter, believe me, people longed for them just like they longed for spring. Just like when you wait for your exam dates or the way a feast is expected, so people waited for the gypsies and we prepare some tools for them to fix. They throw those beans, so many things. George's day was another opportunity for Kumovi to meet. Now Kumsto is a particular institution of spiritual kinship, similar to God parenthood, 
which can be forged between two people, but then extends to their entire households. And it really established a mutual uh, care, protection, and affection between these. Sometimes it, it would be traced, you know, for longer than a century, and it would be a kind of a, a form of kinship. And proverbially, one's kum is closer than a brother. Uh, and this spiritual kinship in Gatsko was exclusively cross-religious, formed between Christians and Muslims, I was told. One of my interlocutors said, it was a common approach and the greatest bond of friendship between Serbs and Muslims. Muslim women in the field would not cover their faces before Orthodox Christian men as with a kum, it was as if a member of your family was there. There was no hiding. Now, the interfaith encounters of St. George's Day, however, only marked the entry into the season of hard labor. Cattle herding, field work, and jobs in the gigantic thermal power plant built by socialist, the socialist Yugoslav state in the 70s took up most of the summertime. One last annual feast was required, a gathering par excellence, awaited and desired throughout the year, Elijah's Day, on the 2nd of August, according to the Julian calendar. Muslims call it Alijun, Serbs Ilindan. It is the turning point of the summer, marking the end of the harvest and the heavy workload. A ubiquitous saying in the field of Gatsko goes, until noon Ilia, afternoon Alia. For Orthodox Christians, the day started with the morning prayer in the church of St. Elijah in the village of Nadanici, and for Muslims around noon near the Kula Mosque and the spring of Sopot. Elijah's day is traditionally the culmination of the social calendar. As my interlocutors told me, everyone knew that the winter is approaching and that this feast was the final outlet for interaction. There was an abundance of food and drink, group singing and dancing, and the number of peculiar athletic tournaments like climbing up a pillar covered with grease, or rock from the shoulder. Younger people flirted with each other, others sat in shade in the shade and talked. Fistfights between groups of men were not uncommon either, although I did not wit witness any. They came as a sort of ritual cleansing of emotions. All communication was condensed into this one day, which commemorated the social life of the community. And as soon as one Elijah's day ended, as my interlocutors told me, people would steer the entire year towards the next one, planning, waiting, and dreaming of the next 2nd of August. So as you can see, a closer analysis of the configuration of these two places, of the nationalist and this kind of sacral uh, uh, calendar, revealed temporal rifts in Gatsko. And so I repeated to myself Roy Wagner's questions. Are there different kinds of time or merely different ways of counting time? Does time have a structure as a clock does or does it merely seem to have a structure because a clock has one? The rhythms, the sequences, the durations, the expectations between the two fields of Gatsko were qualitatively different. And most importantly, they formed two different spatiotemporal systems of orientation. Now, Mikhail Bakhtin coined the term chronotope to indicate the indivisibility of spatial and temporal categories, admittedly only with regards to its function in literature. Time, he noted, thickens, takes on flesh, and space becomes charged and responsive to the movements of time, plot, and history. I employed chronotope as a heuristic device to think of the divergent social currents in the field of Gatsko. Chronotope is a discernible alliance of time and space, a time thickened, uh, as Bakhtin said, in a landscape and a set of practices and relationships, a space articulated through a time of specific quality. Each chronotope has its own story, or rather I would say each chronotope is a story situating the protagonist. 
the choice of chronotopic orientation in Gatsko had obvious political implications. Although the lives of the field told many stories, just like lives anywhere else, there were two dominant systems of spatiotemporal orientation. It wasn't just the case of multiple, but contrasting chronotopes that people had to function in. Unlike Bakhtin's literally, literary image of man who is always intrinsically chronotopic, I have argued that people and landscapes are sometimes trapped between time spaces and thus schizochronotopic, uh, from the Greek schizane to split. What I encountered in Gatsko were two salient overarching collective themes. They both relied on certain kinds of past and laid claims to the field's future. I sometimes untangle them to make the narratives easier, but these two fields were not simply parallel space-time dimensions because the two chronotopes had to meet in daily life despite opposing each other. So to make the schizochronotopic conundrum easier, we can turn to the question of waiting. How is waiting tied into these two overarching systems of orientation? Elijah's day was the first piece of temporal heritage that the returnees had restored. For about two decades now, each second of August, thousands of displaced people living in the diasporas across the world gather in Gatsko for a single day. Time and community seemed to be, if for a moment, regained. After their leaving, the few elderly people who remained scattered around the Gatsko villages would retreat into the time space of home. Their narratives, again, saturated with the past of the landscape in which the future of Elijah's coming used to be an expected certainty. And again, they waited for Elijah all year round, but this was now a double coded waiting, a waiting to wait, a waiting to wait the way they once waited, a waiting for time to resemble itself. In his Waiting the Whites of South Africa, anthropologist Vincent Crapanzano understood waiting as a kind of passive activity through which the waiters he studied lose their grip over the present and have no control over the future. He noted, the world in its immediacy slips away. It is derealized. It is without elan, vitality, creative force. It is numb, muted, dead. Its only meaning lies in the future, in the arrival or the non-arrival of the object of waiting. For the most part, this is precisely what the waiting in Gatsko was not. Although certainly faced with dread, it was through waiting that the returnee's world was voiced, realized, enlivened, given meaning. To give up when waiting meant to give up completely. Rethinking the agency of waiting Ghassan Hajj suggested that we understand it not only as passive activity, but also as active passivity. Waiting keeps alive that which is awaited. It works towards the realization of its own goal. Reflecting on the migrants waiting to return home, Salim Laka has argued that their waiting is not passive, but rather an active conversation with the present even a resistance. Similarly, in her ethnography, uh, Ruba Saleh considers the temporariness and precarity of Palestinian refugee camps that became a permanent transgenerational horizon. She thinks about the political qualities of such persistent temporariness in the struggle against the normalization of the occupation. Or when Steph Janssen wrote about the temporal entrapments, the meantime of the Sarajevo suburb of Dobrinya, he noticed that people still waited for the public buses, for example, to arrive on time, continually complaining about the disorganized post-war state and desiring the supposedly punctual Yugoslav bus arrivals. As if describing the situation in the field, he noted, the oath was thus opposed to the is 
but intimately related to the was. People in this suburb performed their desires for normal lives by waiting for the bus and the visibility of the state's order. People in the field of Gatsko waited for the feast of Elijah and the visibility of the community thus structured. Now, the many traditional proverbs and sayings about waiting charted out the logic of the future waiting in the field. When someone was in a hurry, but ran up against an unavoidable schedule, people would ironically refer to a structural inequality that required waiting. Cool your heels until the priest's grain is milled. Or they would reference the certainty of the seasons in their advice. Don't die, donkey, before the mound turns green. The same local knowledge recalled that waiting and subtle efforts had a particular strength. Silent water rolls the hills. In Gatsko, the creativity of waiting lied precisely in that it worked around the impossibility of direct confrontation with the state. It was waiting as oriented endurance. Yet, unlike the traditional form of waiting for Elijah, the returnee's waiting was no longer a qualification of some certainty. When Elijah used to be an expected certainty, the worst curse in the field was, may you not await to see the next Elijah's day. Along with the discontinuation of this curse after the war, waiting had been imbued with the precariousness of the present. However much the two Gatsko chronotopes worked to erase or forget each other, there were discernible moments when they met. One was when the diasporic Elijah's Day visitors started to leave. Another one was revealed in loneliness. Returnees mostly lived lonely, solitary lives, and the land itself was perceived as lonely. It was unattended, dissocialized, confined, and withdrawn. One strategy of dealing with loneliness was a life in the past of the landscape, filled with desired social relations. Given the absence of a younger generation, the transfer of memory had shifted from public performance to intimate narrative. The returnees seldom spoke about the war or life in exile, almost as if that period of their lives lacked language. It seemed as if their toolbox for time reckoning was not really equipped to deal with the unwanted absence of community and habitual relations. And when the war was mentioned, it somehow always came back to the encounters with the old landscape. I would spend hours hearing about the male choirs causing the village lamps to burst with their bachata tenors during the Elijah's Day festivities, the village boys lined up in makeshift dresses for their circumcision rites of passage, the seasonal succession of medicinal herbs in the field, the intricate workings of fairies and ghostly apparitions. A sigh meant that my interlocutors had been shaken into sudden lucidity. Something had broken through their temporal transposition and we were back in the now, the after the war. The absence summed up by a short lamentation or a sip of coffee or a deep pull on the cigarette or the heaviest of silences. It was only when I started transcribing my recorded conversations that I noticed the endings, the regressions. And here I give you some of them. So these are the endings of, of some of my conversations, or different conversations with different interlocutors. What can you do? Where there used to be 700 households, now there are 30 souls, all old like me. There, that's how it was. There was beauty, there really was. There were many things, but there you go. But now, by God, none of that exists. The villages have died out, almost completely died out. Ah, they were beautiful traditions. Now it has all dissipated. Nobody practices them anymore. There is no life, not here. It won't. There is no, there is no, there is no, there is no life. By God, there were lots of stuff before, my son. 
And today it cannot be. They've taken all of this. Today, nothing can be as it was before. They are no more. There are no more fairies, no good ones, these saints. There is nobody to see ghostly apparitions, utvare, nor to experience nur, the supernatural light coming from the graves of the good. These and hundreds of similar temporal adjustments were how long narratives of how it used to be usually ended. Bodily immersion in a past landscape lingered like a phantom limb its sensations were relived with the excitement and texture of immediacy before regressing into the present. The present committed repetitive acts of violence upon the effectively returning landscape. All these endings were moments of disenchantment. In them, the field of magic beings of goodness uh, had disappeared. The general tenor of narration would take a sharp turn from rich and vibrant descriptions, visceral and tactile reconstructions, often laughter toward brief, fractured and sober realizations of an explicit loss and the usual moment of silence. Elaine Scarry has argued that physical pain might resist language, but simultaneously also shatter it by deconstructing it into the pre-language of cries and groans. The awakening silence following narratives in Gatsko is a shattered language, a kind of post language, a bodily arrest at the overwhelmingly unnarratable, an inexpressibility marking the point where the two chronotopes face each other. Looking at a photograph of his house in Bombay, Salman Rushdie wrote in his imaginary homelands, the past is a foreign country, goes the famous opening sentence of L.P. Hartley's novel, The Go-Between. They do things differently there. But the photograph reminds me that this is, that it's my present that is foreign and that the past is home, albeit a lost home in a lost city in the mists of lost time. Gatsko's present was likewise broken up into an elicited present past felt as stable and homely, and a recurring and unwanted present present felt as uncertain and unhomely. Steff Janssen and Stefan Lofing have highlighted this temporal scale of home. Uh, open quote. Home itself then needs to be problematized and particularly the self-evidence with which it is territorialized. If we fail to do so, Home is all too easily represented unwittingly as a timeless entity in an unchanging context of origin, something that is particularly inappropriate if we take into account that context is often one of dramatic transformation such as war or socioeconomic restructuring." Close quotes. Haris Khalilovic has likewise argued that for displaced Bosnians, the original place is not located in space anymore, but in time which has passed. Now, the legal document that regulated migration in the entity of Republika Srpska, which I mentioned earlier, forced migrants to migrate swiftly between legal categories. They ceased to be displaced as soon as they entered upon the status of returnees. Article 10 of the same legal act noted, the status of returnee shall cease by the expiration of the six month deadline counting from the day when the, competent, when the competent body issued the certificate of returnee status. The idea that people in Gatsko could have regained their lives spatially or otherwise within just six months is divorced from any kind of reality. There, this time placement, it's a cumbersome word, but it's, it's a kind of exile from, from their time space, this lasts for almost three decades now, even though they're spatially after six months returned. So home for, for them appeared as a locus allied with time of specific quality. And the question of hope, of whether the lost can be imagined as somehow regained, was for them a question on whether the return of a temporally specific landscape was possible. In the introduction to his principle of hope, Ernst Bloch wrote, hope superior to fear 
is neither passive like the latter nor locked into nothingness. However, the fear and the hope of the field's returnees were not mutually exclusive. Rather, they challenged each other's persistence and channeled each other's expressions in everyday life. The delicate hope produced by this dialectic seldom acquired the manifest, some manifest superiority. It was understood that what had been and what is now are embroiled in a mortal combat over some future plateaus. As Francis Pine noted, through the fear that lies in uncertainty, hope is always mirrored or shadowed by its opposite, despair. Now, Delva, one of my interlocutors, uh, did not resolutely embrace, you know, any big hopes. She was a returnee to the village of Kula only during the warm months. She stayed with her children in the city of Mostar during the winter. Her hope of return was only ever short term, to come back the next spring. And I came to know this most effectively when I helped her paint the walls of her kitchen. Next to her dwelling room, it looked exposed, unhomely. She gave me her son's old shirt so that I did not soil mine. When we were done with the painting, she cooked a chicken dish for us and we watched television together. Much later, I noticed on this photograph that you see here, the apron that she was wearing that day, adorned with red apples and white flowers that said, home, sweet home, in English. I still wonder how ontologically removed from the field this image was and whether we can ever allow ourse ourselves to speak of home as such. Delva's kitchen, which stood for her hope of return, was not a bold and uttered hope, but one performed through a small restorative task. The tensions between the yearning for home and the fear of return were often resolved by death. Bodies were returned to be buried where they belong, close to their destroyed homes and dead ancestors. I spent one summer afternoon on an outing with the Chustovich family in the village of Tsernitsa. We camped between the graveyard and the stone rubble that used to be their home, or in fact, which is their home. One of their sons was working as an expert for an oil company in Texas, and the other as a DJ in Croatia. Nobody had immediate plans to live in the village. Their outings were becoming a recurrent practice, a peculiar ritual of being at home. Alvedin's grandmother, Fata, went into exile shortly before the war and had been one of the first returnees. I was puzzled by this fact as there was not a single habitable house on their land. How could, how could she have returned? And Alvedin told me her mate, her corpse, returned amongst the first. She asked to be buried here next to her husband. Others have told me about the Gurbeti Roma families who, as part of uh, who inhabited Gatsko before the war, uh, coming back from Belgium to bury uh, someone in the local cemetery. And these returnee bodies were another intimate strategy of dealing with the loss of home. Within the tapestry of affective remains, these bones, bodies, ancestors acted upon the exiled. And to return dead was, for many, a form of hope. Phantom Liu voices of the old field, textured, lively, and abundant, were actively negotiating the unwanted present. Through affective temporal transpositions, they seemed unwilling to forfeit their claims over the future. Home, which meant many things, all of them different from the present, was performed daily, almost as a prayer. And any sign of home's restoration from the reconstructed buildings, the birth of the only Returnee child, the Elijah's Day diasporic arrivals, or the resolve of the dead bodies to come back was taken as a limited indication of the future. Home was the prerequisite for hope. Many existing texts about waiting have looked into the phenomenon uh, as the bodily experience of time, the existential encounter of our body within, with the pace of the world. In the passage of waiting, Henri Bergson argued, time is lived, the world coincides with our own duration, and we come to know the substance of our existence and the existence of the world. Building on Bergson's philosophical writings, 
Harold Schweitzer saw waiting as the intimacy of time. The waiter thus feels impatiently his own being, he wrote. Time enters our bodies. We are the time that passes. However, the focus on duration and experience of time through waiting uh, is, well, reveals uh, but one of the qualities of waiting. And I, we need to understand the structures, the collective experiences, and as we see in Gatsko, the traditions of waiting uh, that cut across various scales. Uh, sort of intimate, bodily, communal, collective, institutional, and so on. Or as Ghassan Haj noted, the differences in waiting are not just differences in individual forms of waiting. There are also differences in the way waiting is present systemically in society. Now, in closing, I would like to repeat a couple of verses from a poem by Makdizdar, a Bosnian poet. Just a couple of verses, it's a much longer poem. It is time to think of time. Lo, it is time to think in time. What puzzles me is the difference between the thinking of time and the thinking in time. The people of Gatsko were exiled not only from their land, but from the temporal structures and experiences, from the cyclical calendar with its seasonal and daily movements and proximities. In their disorientation, these spatiotemporal migrants were made to think of time. The temporal structures were foregrounded through their denial. Or as another Bosnian poet, Abdullah Sidran once remarked, I found out that I have a neck only when they started strangling me. To recognize time, to think of it, to wait for it, can be a powerful tool in reclaiming home. In so doing, the returnees to the field of Gatsko worked against the systems of temporal disinheritance that latched onto their bodies with unimaginable force. Thank you so much for listening to this rather long presentation. I appreciate it very much, and I look forward to some questions, comments, and just our conversation. Oh, thank you so much. That was fantastic. A really rich and evocative paper, which uh, to me had many resonances with um, uh, other diasporic communities, other experiences. Um, I really enjoyed it. So whilst everybody is thinking of their questions, maybe I can uh, get us going. I'm sorry, I still seem to have a blank screen. I, I am quite happy to be seen, but <laughs> that, that seems to be a problem. Um, okay, so Safa, I wondered if I could start off by asking you this whole notion of before, yeah? Because you very um, successfully described this construction of a idyllic, um, a, a sort of a, using the past to sort of look at some sort of idyllic present with a sort of view to looking for the future. But I wondered if you could say a little bit about how far back this before goes, how far back um, in time before is and what is actually being constructed. I'm thinking particularly about the socialist period and how it fits into this whole experience about whether it's a, a, a blip in the middle of a sort of longer history or if some of this actually does relate to ideas of a socialist past and how that's actually lacking in the present. So uh, maybe if you could start us off with that, we could take it from there. Thank you so much, Parvati. That's such a, a, a fantastic question because uh, what transpires is that, you know, if we think about the socialist past and it certainly made, and I, uh, I write about this in, in the book and some other places, the uh, socialism certainly made an intervention into the landscape, into the lives of these people, uh, you know, physical interventions like that uh, huge thermal power plant, but it made temporal interventions. And it's sought to make temporal interventions. And there's a, a very interesting documentary about the making of the thermal power plant. And the narrator says, time uh, was once measured through sheep and bare life here, but, time, but from now on time will be measured as before the power plant and after the power plant. So it was a very sort of articulated temporal intervention. Um, at the same time, 
socialist calendar closely followed and sort of aligned to this cyclical kind of traditional sacral calendar. And uh, uh, so, you know, the, the, the best example is the 1st of May uh, kind of celebration, which, you know, you know, just five days be before uh, or after, depending on which calendar you take, St. George's Day, uh, pretty much the same kind of get togethers and rituals and so on. Um, uh, uh, really a celebration of spring or kind of a mass kind of gathering and so on. Uh, also all of the other rituals were um, seen as more of a kind of a, a folk thing, more of a kind of a rather than religious uh, by the state. So a lot of these gatherings, because they included all the dance and kind of a mass of people, lots of drinks, food, they weren't seen so much as kind of the, the, the religious thing. So what, what they did, you know, and I think this is what nationalists are doing as well, they sort of uh, built onto an existing framework. And in, in that sense, uh, there is no significant rupture in these narratives of my interlocutors, um, you know, about this past, you know, of this kind of idealized past, you know, looking into the cyclical calendar. And, uh, and nationalism is using, uh, you know, some of the main building blocks, you know, these feasts and so on. The nationalists are very much doing that. But at the same time, the kind of communal gatherings, the kind of interactions between people of different religious groups and so on, that, that is what they're uh, kind of uh, fighting against and very much kind of erasing. Uh, so in that sense, that's a very clear rupture and it also produced all this exile. So the 1990s really are a breaking point. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, because it um, illustrates how socialists themselves were using this sort of uh, romantic notion of the past to help produce a sense of continuity. So it wasn't just about rupture, but people taking people with them in some sort of continuous history. So I think that's uh, really interesting. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. So uh, Kim, do we have any other questions? I can't actually see. I hear you. You need to unmute yourself. Uh, Kim. So yes, uh, we don't have any questions in the chat just yet, but if any of you would like to enter any in, please do feel free. And also equally, if you'd like to raise your hand to ask a question, you can do. So uh, feel free and uh, then we'll invite you to ask your question. And uh, I know it's quite a, lot, quite a lot of information to take in, but do any questions you have or thoughts you have, do feel free to add them into the chat or to raise your hand. Perhaps while we're waiting, Suffolk, you could tell us a little bit about when you were last doing your um, field work, when mm -hmm. it was you were last doing your field work. Uh, and you're out then. Maybe how long? Because the other thing that struck me was that um, these are very intimate histories in a way, mm -hmm. and that uh, people are talking about uh, a lot of thing, uh, quite traumatic events, and how they're sort of helping to heal these ruptures. So, um, how did you find it doing your fieldwork in those sorts of circumstances? I mean, how willing were people to talk to you about these issues? Was it something that they wanted to talk about? But I mean, that was in itself, if you like, a part of the creation of this sort of uh, idealization of the past or um, did it take more than that? Uh, so, so most of this, uh, all of what, I, what I'm talking about, uh, what I was talking about today relates to, to field work that I've conducted in 2011, 12 and 13. Um, and, uh, uh, f you know, for, you know, a bit longer than, than, a, than a year. And it was really kind of following these various kind of seasonal changes. But then because of the disrupted kind of not only community, but also this calendar, uh, I really wanted to understand it. And you saw some of the images from other places. I wanted to branch out sort of to, uh, uh, to understand these nodes in the calendar uh, where they actually are practiced still like St. George's Day and so on. Um, so, so it was also a, a multi-sided fieldwork to a certain extent. Um, so, th so this, uh, you know, which, which is the, the, the main point of, of Waiting for Elijah, my, my book, um, it, it really relates to an early, earlier fieldwork in, in that time in 2012. And um, apologies, there was another part of your question that I have now 
seem to have forgotten. Oh, no, no, I was just asking uh, how happy people were to talk about oh, around yes. these kind of events, yeah, in this history. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, so I uh, conducted research with, um, on the one hand, with returnees, and on the other hand, with usually, again, elderly people, because there's a lot of brain drain from Gatsko uh, anyway, um, uh, in, in Orthodox Christian villages. And uh, in both kind of settings, which are now very much divided and sort of uh, opposed to each other, um, politically in both settings, uh, there was almost kind of a, a desire to, to transfer these narratives to me that I noticed. Uh, I, and, you know, somebody mentioned, well, this is usually how, uh, you know, older people, uh, you know, like to speak to younger people. And I was a very young anthropologist then. Uh, but uh, it's not just that there was a, a kind of a, almost a transference of what would be the kind of life and that public ritual and so on, what would be lived, uh, you know, with the absence of younger generation, with the absence of other ways to transfer it, to translate it. It was, it seemed to me, it was, uh, um, I was welcomed as a person who would then receive this knowledge, which wasn't meant for me uh, originally. Great, and I think we have a question from um, Rebecca. Yes, thank you so much for the presentation and for your insights. It was really interesting to hear. Um, I had to think first when you talked about um, your, when you began to introduce the theme of waiting, I had to think about prožuri polako. So even though you hurry up, <laughs> uh, you can still take your time. So uh, no worries about that. Um, that was really some nice thought I had. And the question I have now for you, maybe you want to go into that is, that I thought about the younger generation now. So I met a lot of people. I used to live in Bielina in uh, Republika Srpska and a lot of people in their early twenties, for example, mm. they wait a lot. And I have the feeling that they wait for something they do not really believe in anymore. So there's this loss of hope and you stressed the meaning of hope for especially the older generation. So maybe you would like to say a few words about that if you want to, that would be great. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I imagine, you know, given, you know, the, kind, the kinds of histories, uh, although possibly Bielina has seen uh, a slightly uh, kind of mo more returnees and, uh, than, than Gatsko, uh, but similar histories of ethnic cleansing, um, I would imagine that the situations are also similar. So what I noticed whenever uh, in the re returnee kind of community, uh, there was uh, um, one younger couple who returned uh, from the United States. They had this child that was the only child in the returnee community. And there was another person of my age who uh, lived somewhere else, but because his grandparents had returned, he would come back. And uh, uh, and they were very uh, strikingly different uh, in terms of younger people. It was much more diverse in terms of how they might wait or not. So many of them uh, had already plans to leave. And it was uh, kind of directed usually towards Banja Luka or Belgrade to study. Um, uh, or somewhere else, um, whereas others, and you could notice how some of these orientations formed. So for example, Edo, uh, this uh, uh, person of my age who would return uh, seasonally uh, to live with his grandparents, he was very intimately, he had intimate knowledge of this landscape, even though he was a couple of months old when they went into exile. and. His grandmother was actually the one who took him uh, in, in her arms and they ran towards the mountains. But he had this intimate knowledge. And when I met his grandmother, I un understood completely why. And it's this kind of craft of storytelling. And Zahida, his grandmother, was a very eloquent, very kind of uh, skilled storyteller. And the way he um, kind of... Uh, related both to the past of the landscape and the way he waited for uh, kind of the return of Elijah was very different. And it was really, again, because of this transfer 
uh, of the kind of traditional waiting that, that his grandmother very much embodied. Um, so there was that influence of that generation. But you're right, there is um, uh, very much, a, I think, a process of giving up on waiting for people who are now, no, you know, it's not even young people, it's people uh, uh, you know, in their 30s and 40s who kind of waited and waited and waited for something to happen. And every sign is taken, like elections very recently, as some kind of movement. But it's, uh, there is a lot of kind of giving up on waiting, I think, with younger people. Whereas the older people, I think, uh, probably feel that, they, that, that there is nothing to lose either way, and that there is kind of this push towards the return of Elijah. And then I think we had another question. Um, coming in. Shall I? Yes. Hi. Hi, Safed. That was really, really brilliant. And um, uh, I really, really enjoyed that as, as much as I enjoyed your book. Um, I had a question that um, really links up your research with my ongoing research in South Turkey, in Antakya, which uh, engages um, uh, belief in Al-Hudur, uh, Hazir Al-Hudur, as um, uh, Elijah or St. George is referenced or referred to in um, the geography where I worked. Of course, these are uh, largely interconnected geographies, of course, and if we were to uh, write them not as national geographies or post-Ottoman, post-colonial geographies, but as Cosmo geographies or cosmological geographies, uh, your spaces and mine would be entirely interlinked. Uh, but I had two related questions, if I may. The first one is the main discontinuity that you refer to in your um, paper, which really brilliantly, as you do in your book, you refer to as a schizochronotopia or a chronotopic discontinuity, refers to the uh, war of the 1990s, the before and the after, and people waiting for, for a previous time somehow. Um, I find that very, very compelling. Uh, but a follow-up question to that would be, is that the only kind of discontinuity that you have found in relation to Elijah St. George, in the sense that this is a, a very long uh, tradition um, that spans, um, I don't know if it spans, uh, of course it, it spans back to Ottoman times, but even uh, perhaps uh, before that, but are there uh, previous discontinuities that you have found while tracing uh, the route of Elijah? That is out of interest, the first one. The second one is a reflection that comes from my own research on Al-Hudr um, Hazir St. George in uh, South Turkey. And that is that um, almost sadly, tragically, the opposite has happened from my observations in that um, uh, Al-Hudr or Hazir, which referred to uh, somehow, as you note, a shared uh, sacred experience in the past has been reinterpreted in the aftermath of the Syrian war and the shadow that it has cast over Turkey, as well as Turkey's involvement, direct involvement, active involvement uh, in the Syrian war, to, um, in, uh, uh, amongst Arab Alawis at least, to a reinterpretation of uh, Al-Hudr as somehow their prophet, almost, um, uh, we could say by reference to your ethnography, um, the new chronotope in your terms, uh, swallowing up or taking over the previous one in a very sad way. And I was wondering whether you have um, observed um, similar such tendencies in your research. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, thank you, Yael. Um, I'm so happy that you're here, and I will absolutely be the first person to buy uh, your book on Hidr and, uh, and cosmography. Um, I so very much look forward to it. Um, and um, what other kinds of discontinuities? Um, I, I was thinking of how, you know, lots of discontinuities, which not necessarily, you know, which are not necessarily recorded in, in different kinds of archives become recorded in, in language. 
uh, and how people, but they become recorded in a kind of uh, didactic way in, in terms of how people deal with them. So there was this, you know, the, the big uh, um, proverb that really attracted me to this space. And, you know, it's a kind of pan Bosnian proverb until noon Ilya, afternoon Alia. I mean, what, what, what is uh, encapsulated there is at, at once a kind of a, a discontinuity and, and the meeting and an encounter, a certain kind of shift, a change and so on. And it certainly uh, kind of is thinking about this, um, I, I, nobody can for sure say how, how old this is, but it kind of, it encapsulates some of that kind of change and uh, possibly uh, it relates to, to a certain uh, kind of, um, Plurification of religions, shall we say, not to use uh, um, some other uh, uh, more crude terms. So possibly, you know, kind of when when the Ottomans uh, kind of acquired this area of the Balkans, um, and th there are other discontinuities. You know, when when I think of the kind of twentieth century, certainly uh, in terms of how, for example, that power plant was built on the locus of Elijah's day feast. Uh, later on, Elijah's feasts were kind of held in two different locations. This is something I didn't have time to go into, but the oldest one is actually in the middle between the Orthodox Christian and the Muslim villages. And this now sits under, you know, very much, you know, the way they wanted to rebuild time with the power, um, thermal power plant. That's how they sort of uh, placed that symbol of that new time on top of the old symbol of the old time. Um, and then for, uh, for sure, the uh, expulsion, and this, I think this perhaps relates uh, to, to, the que to the second question you had as well, um, the uh, cleansing of saints, uh, particularly through the institutions of the church. Um, and we can see that, you know, these saints, which possibly, you know, I, I don't think I've ever asked anybody in Gatsko whether, you know, they were kind of uh, an ardent nationalist or not about Elijah's day without some kind of narrative about the kind of the shared aspects of this day. But the way kind of these feasts are organized now by the Serbian Orthodox Church in Gatsko and so on, it includes a lot of very violent nationalism, a lot of parading of symbols and so on. And they're being cleansed out of, uh, you know, of their shared meaning and shared histories and shared practices. And this is absolutely visible across Bosnia. It's a very kind of slow, insidious process. Um, and then, you know, suddenly you wake up and you read uh, something about uh, a feast that you thought everybody, of course, understands it's a shared feast. You know, everybody has the, those histories in one way or, or another. Uh, but the, the, in the news, you know, a politician will be talking about the feast as, you know, as, you know, this pan-Serbian feast that unites Serbia and Republika Srpska in Bosnia and so on and so on. And, uh, and this kind of just began as a process in the late 80s and the 90s. And certainly, you know, one can see it with the Muslim ethnoscape and, um, with the Orthodox Christian one, with the Catholic one, and so on. Um, and then I wonder, on the other hand, sorry to take such a long time in, in, in my reply, I wonder, so when you were saying that this kind of reinterpretation or claiming, or the claiming of Hidr, you were, you were speaking about Kurdish claims, or Syrian. Or, um, Arab Alawi, actually. Arab Alawi, Alawi. okay. Um, I wonder if, if it's similar to what uh, Roma people in Bosnia are doing now. Uh, so very much, you know, Roma feasts still, and the ones I visited across Bosnia of St. George's Day, they include, you know, people of different kinds of religions or ethnicities, whatnot. Uh, yet there is a drive towards kind of branding this a little bit more. And I think very much it relates to a lot of these, you know, of uh, NGOs that are doing their work to kind of strengthen the community and their kind of right to heritage and identity and so on. But what happens in the meantime is that you speak, especially to younger people and say, no, 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 but St. George's Day is Roma Day, first and foremost, and then it's other people's day. And, uh, and it's a kind of process which, you know, you can see some of the stakeholders, you can see it being developed. Um, 
And uh, yet, when you actually arrive to the festivity, um, I asked, you know, I made a mistake. I asked, you know, are there any, you know, kind of uh, Serbs, Muslims, are there any, any non-Roma people here? And then this woman, you know, who was uh, kind of, she was engaged in a ritual of washing her face. She turned quite angrily to me and she said, I am a Serb, you know, so it's, it's just to kind of show that this, these kind of narratives, they might, uh, you know, work discursively, but in terms of the actual practice, you know, people kind of push back and people continue certain practices anyway. And I wonder whether that will be the case with the Alawi. Sorry for a long answer. Thank, thank you. you. And I thought I might invite David, if you want to share your thoughts. I know you've put a few comments in the chat and it would be good to hear from you. So if you would like to, <laughs> I think I've unmuted you. Hi, yeah. Hi, Safet. Yeah, thanks so much for your presentation. It was just really amazing to hear it. Um, I guess I want to tell you a little bit about my background. I um, I worked with an international NGO in Bosnia from 2000 to 2003, and uh, it was UMCOR, United Methodists. Uh, they were, we were the, what did we call it, the, the secular division of the church. But <laughs> anyway, we used to, so I, I wrote a, you know, a lot of integrate return pro minority return programs that we had funding from the Dutch government and, and the, in the U.S. government. And so they were, and it was just, we did like, I think 30 of these return programs all around the country. Um, and I guess I often had to tell a story similar to you just to kind of get the money from the donors about how, you know, why we were going to help, help. you know, the idea was to get minorities to return and to sort of reverse the war aims of, of sort of cleansing. Um, so a lot of those programs were, were, were just, you know, housing programs, um, you know, we would help them with shelter and uh, livelihoods, this type of thing to get people to come back. But I guess I was kind of discouraged, but not surprised when I, you know, you were sort of describing how it was really the older people who came back um, and really not, you know, and it seems like a lot of those returns weren't really sustained, you know, I think, um, you know, obviously, I guess they had to deal with the community around them, not wanting them to be there and, uh, you know, livelihoods is a, is a big problem um and yeah i think obviously the younger folks would just try to go where the jobs were where they thought they could find a future and uh so it's just um you know i guess what you've written is i mean i didn't really study after 2003 i sort of followed it with with interest but i didn't really have like you know like a longitudinal approach where i could see what happened to my particular village afterwards but i can think for example of only there's only one village i remember where you know we would put a we do the housing, we would work, help them with livelihoods, we'd have radio shows so that people could discuss returns. And you know, we even got the government to sort of put in like some electrical lines. Um, and there was just, this is only one village that I can remember where, there were, it seemed like the people, the minority came back. This was in uh, Kuprez, this is sort of a predominantly Croat area, but these were Serbs who came back. Um, and they're the only ones who came back because we just threw everything we had at them, you know, like just, just like, electricity and <laughs> they had to build their own houses you know they had to we gave them cows you know and it just you just think of that that the amount of effort that goes into trying to make that that, that village come back to life and you know i that, a year later they were there and the electricity was on and they seemed to be making a living and and uh, but i i wonder right now is like you know if i went back there what 17 years later would they still be there i, mean, I don't know i mean i I, I kind of tend to think that it would maybe really it's just the economy for the old people. It's it's their memories of you know of their life and their culture, but for the young young people, they know that you know they need to make a real living somehow, and that's why you have so many people leaving, or um you know or you know or you know going to the big cities like you know to to, to make a living. So yeah, I don't know. Anyway, those are those are my comments. I re I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much. I mean, it's very interesting to to uh, to meet. You know, I've read a lot of these reports from different projects, sustainable return here and there, and to meet you know people who have worked on it. And I know that uh, today we have at least two, or actually three, people working on cultural heritage in Bosnia, and what their findings show, particularly Amra's, uh, is that uh, uh, the reconstruction of cultural heritage. Uh, and Amra was concerned with the uh, built cultural heritage for the most part, but these kind of traditions and cultural heritage and just kind of uh, these scapes uh, that, that are known to people are, uh, you know, as important or more important than, uh, uh, than, you know, having, you know, a reconstructed house. And so you had this school, you know, reconstructed, a huge school, fully fitted school in, in the Kula village, um, but 
the same amount of attention was not paid to, because there was no understanding from within of what really matters to people. And, you know, if <laughs> there was attention to St. George's Day, Elijah's Day, uh, you know, Kasum, Mitravdan, and so on, these kind of uh, temporal points and the gatherings and the kind of attention to community building and sustainable life there, in that sense, I think uh, that the, the, those programs would be much more successful. Um, and, you know, the, the, so Yael, you know, mentioned Syria and all of these kind of new spaces we can think of in terms of destruction or after Bosnia. Um, and I wonder, you know, now, I mean, I'm not even sure what the situation is in Syria, to tell you the truth, you know, in terms of uh, the armed violence. But after the armed violence ends, uh, there will be like, like, uh, you know, birds from the sky, these uh, people will descend, the NGOs, the companies, the different kinds of international organizations to, to figure out, you know, how to help. And there's also lots and lots of uh, kind of, lots of funds are moving through. Uh, uh, through those hands. And, you know, the question is, should we then learn from what we already know, the kinds of mistakes that were made, for example, in Bosnia, of not having the, the, this kind of anthropological knowledge, or, you know, you, you don't even have to call it anthropological, just kind of intimate, a long-term understanding um, of, of those spaces. And certainly in Syria, the kinds of syncretisms, shared landscapes, and so on, uh, are very uh, very similar question to be asked, um, or in Yemen and so on. Yeah, thank I was going to mention. I mean, I know that for us, they, we, we were constantly changing and improving the, the program approaches, and I think in that time, like raw politics and power had everything to do with whether people could come back, whether you could get support, whether you know it was just it was a lot of fighting and kind of just just you had to when you fight among all the groups to see whether you could put somebody back in there. So yeah, it was very imperfect, you know. Um, I don't know. I mean, I I feel like yeah, I, we we learned a lot, but I I don't know. It's it's I don't know what to make of it really at this point. <laughs> you know, it's just tragic. That's all. I guess it's that maybe it's that. So that was the the lacking area, if you like. If that you could build something new, you mm -hmm. can build something, you know, uh, that has facilities that you need, but. Mm -hmm people can also have that elsewhere. So what would draw them back? And if you looked at more of the cultural and kind of the anthropological mm -hmm. kind of pools, that would make the difference between deciding where you were then going to reside, whether you were going to return or whether you were going to start a new life somewhere mm -hmm. else that, you know, maybe doesn't have those ties. So I guess it's that, it's, it's going back to what you say, the importance of the cultural side of things to really mm -hmm. have that pull to people to come back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, but, but, you know, these kind of configurations of home, um, um, I think, you know, time it, differently configured and as, as the body gets used to something else, um, you know, it's, you know, you can be, I don't know whether this is too strong of a word, but deontologized, you know, or kind of de destemporalized. Uh, Vanya and I have this project on distemporalities right now. You can be kind of distemporalized from particular homes. You know, if, if we mm -hmm. think of time as a form of home, you can be disinherited from it, and your body, you know, gets used to something else. And as the bodies get used to something else, then uh, uh, this kind of uh, pull towards the, the 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 frameworks that you know the older people, the returnees, still feel. You know, gets it gets smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. um, but um, this is, you know, so 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 the the the, the range of replies to, to you know to how to, to whether Gatsko has a future that is religiously plural, you know, with returnees and so on. The range of replies really gets more diverse when you when you ask younger people, mm -hmm. and uh, and some are completely, you know, some think that it's never going to happen. Um, uh, others, you know, are kind of temporarily, I think, giving up, but, you know, they have certain feelings towards the, the landscape that kind of is related to their family narratives. Um, it's probably similar everywhere. 
uh, where, where refugees are concerned. Okay, let's see if we've had any more questions or thoughts coming through. Um, and if anybody else would like to raise their thoughts, do, do let me know and I can uh, unmute you and have you raise your questions or your ideas. Thank you, Christine. I mean, I know many, if not most of people here today <laughs> always certainly continue some of these conversations. Oh, I see Sarah uh, uh, has yeah. raised her hand. Sarah has a raised hand. Let me get up to Sarah. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, yeah. Wonderful. Hi, Safa. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the great presentation. It was thought provoking as always. Also feels really, really topical right now um, with so many people experiencing waiting. I noticed it's all over social media today, or at least all over my, uh, my social media, that it's the anniversary of the first case in Wuhan. And so it's interesting that but to me, it's interesting that people are are marking that already as as a as a moment in time when something changed. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's been really good, and it's great to gain some more kind of uh, vocabulary to to mm. talk about this. I know it's something mm. that um, a lot of my classmates and I are thinking about a lot in our work. Uh, I guess my question for you is maybe. Um, semi-practical which is do you have any advice for students like myself as how to how to work in the field when the field itself is suspended or changed in some way by waiting uh, Sarah that's such a fantastic question I would uh, direct you to um, a couple of thoughts that I uh, recently read um, by Yael, who was uh, speaking er earlier, Yael Navarro. Uh, uh, and she wrote, um, uh, on the one hand, a sort of a, a review in the annual review of anthropology, where she very kindly mentioned my work. Thank you, Yael. Um, a review of uh, sort of anthropological research, which deals with these sort of absences and discontinuities and so on. Uh, it's uh, titled something like uh, Research on Negative Methodology. And there is another, um, I think, blog uh, post uh, or a short article uh, about the possibilities of, of kind of doing anthropological research during this time of the lockdown. And, um, and there are some divergent opinions there. Um, and what I would, what I would, say, first of all, I was very, um, uh, as a, a, my idea was for you, all of you and all of us are experiencing this lockdown right now to perhaps think of some connections to the kinds of distemporalization that we are experiencing uh, around the world in different ways. And, uh, you know, I mentioned, I think you were there in an uh, earlier seminar somewhere that, you know, uh, I'm constantly asking my Google, uh, my Google speaker, what day of the week is it? And I'm completely lost uh, sort of in, 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 in time. And we see that most other people also are. And it's a very similar experience to what, you know, the people in Gatsko, but much more violently were um, exiled, you know, from their time because it has a certain structure that you follow and your bodies live time. They don't have to ask for it so much and to think of it. Um, in terms of what to do in the time of waiting, lots of people are turning to these online spaces and as we are, I think, more generally, uh, and that might be useful. On the other hand, it might also be useful um, uh, to, uh, as we've done in the uh, summer school for anthropology of travel, tourism, and pilgrimage, when you wrote that wonderful autoethnographic essay, to, to take the time to unpack some of the uh, kind of uh, some of these notions through by turning towards ourselves. Um, and then 
My third suggestion would be, I, we anyway always have to negotiate difficult access. And this is the case, uh, you know, with pretty much any anthropologist here in different ways, you know, uh, accessing a very violent nationalist town sleeping, you know, for a time in a hotel, you know, that's spray painted with slogans about uh, people convicted for genocide and, you know, uh, and other kind of more uncomfortable situations. These are all situations that we navigate. And there are, of course, always questions of safety that we also have to think about. And I think this is just one of them. You know, it's not any more serious than the lockdown of Palestine, the occupation of Palestine, the lockdown occupation of, of Yemen and Sana'a the, and so on. It's, um, these are different situations that we kind of uh, very methodically and carefully have to uh, think about how to approach them, how to access them whilst making sure that we and our interlocutors are safe. So I would suggest sort of a, you know, working perhaps against this lockdown as well, in some ways. I don't know if that answers any of the question. It was a ramble more than a reply. No, a that, no that, thank you. That's really helpful. I mean, we've been talking about it um, as a cohort a lot, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. I personally think it's bringing some really interesting opportunities or perspectives but there's definitely a lot of uh, frustration from researchers who aren't going to be able to complete the research they wanted the work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know, perhaps, Yael, would you like to, uh, to offer some advice to Sarah um, based on, on your rec recent thoughts about this topic? Um, sorry, perhaps separate. <laughs> No, at this moment, I would be happy to talk separately. Sure. Okay. Um, I will. I I I can't really put the video on because, um, as Safet knows, I am in a bit of a domestic situation in social isolation, and uh, but I just wanted to really thank you, Safet, for a really brilliant um, talk, uh, which. Thank you. Uh, was not only brilliant intellectually and very deep, but also really poetically delivered. So you leave us with a sense of um, um, really po a possibility of writing and thinking poetically, not only <laughs> uh, ethnographically, which, uh, which w has been very inspiring for me, particularly. Um, so thank you so much for this. Um, and uh, I think I will just leave it to uh, Kim to announce next uh, um, seminar title and um, <clears throat> date and time, and maybe a few details about how to overcome the issues with Zoom that seem <laughs> um, regularly. <laughs> but thank, thank you, you again, so Safet, and thank you everyone who participated tonight and for your thoughtful questions and time. And yeah, as Please, Kim, if you want to announce next. Um... Yes. Yeah. And thank you again, Safet. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today and for all of the, those of you who have joined us um, for multiple sessions that we've run in, in this um, autumn seminar series. Uh, we've had some really great speakers and um, the following events that we have coming up, will, again, um, are really interesting um, speakers and um, they all have um, kind of a different take, but there's kind of a, a common theme. Uh, running through um, through all of our um, through all of our different talks, um, and so we would be happy for you to join us um, for the following event. So I've just put in the chat the link to the Eventbrite um, for our next um, session, and our next session uh, will be running on the twenty fifth of November, um, so in a week's time, same time five till seven. Um, this one is um, face veils, uh, face masks and selective liberal anxiety. So um, again, something I think that's very topical and, and very much of the here and now that we're seeing. Um, so definitely um, feel free to come along to that session. Um, and again, you can um, confirm your place and book your place through the um, Eventbrite link. Um, I will be sending it around to everybody um, who registered for this session, as well as the recording of this session. Um, so again, uh, if you want to kind of listen back um, 
uh, and kind of go through it in more detail. I always find personally, um, I always get something out of re-watching these sessions, if, if not cringing at my own video, but, <laughs> but on kind of really going back through the information. And I think, um, and, and it was so poetically put <laughs> again within this session. So thank you all very much for attending. Um, please feel free to join us with the rest of our talks. Um, we have, so we have this one coming up and then two more afterwards, um, and they normally are week by week. Um, so again, thank you all for taking the time. Thank you, Safet, again, for, um, for delivering such an uh, amazing talk. And um, I hope to see you all in future events. Thank you.